DuPont presents the Cavalcade of America. Before we start this evening's presentation of the Cavalcade of America brought to you by DuPont, we wish to read excerpts from two letters. One from a successful businessman, president of his company, and the other from a housewife. The businessman says, I listen to your broadcast each Wednesday, and it gives me much pleasure to compliment you on what I consider the finest program ever produced, combining education, entertainment, and refinement. The housewife says, We want to express our appreciation of the Cavalcade of America, one of the finest programs ever on the air educational as well as highly entertaining. Thanks again for an extra fine program as well as extra fine products. These two typical comments show how the Cavalcade of America is received by both men and women. In fact, by all members of the family. Our listeners symbolize the many millions of Americans who benefit from the research of DuPont chemists who are ever working toward their goal, better things for better living through chemistry. The DuPont Cavalcade Orchestra plays an overture suggesting the locale of the first episode in this evening's broadcast, a special arrangement of By the Waters of the Minnetonka. Development of her great national resources, 
America has been fortunate in finding strong and hardy workers. This evening, we bring you two stories of notable achievement. The first begins on a night in the spring of 1842 at a lumber camp beside a remote stream in northern Minnesota. Sitting in the moonlight on the pile of logs is Stephen Beck Hanks. His friend, Pierre Bernard, hails him. Steve! Steve! Oh, why you sit out there alone? You tell big stories in the cookhouse. I'm looking at this little river, Pierre. I'm doing some figuring. Did you ever see the water so high? Me? <laughs> when I see water run so fast, I like it. The eyes the logs this great lightning. Maybe I see Jonah and my new baby in two, three weeks. Sure, I want to get home too, but riding the logs on a stream like this is dangerous. Oh, you don't worry, Steve. You don't think about the river, but about home. When I ride into still water, my wife, she said to me again, Pierre, you big fool. Why you leave men and come way out here? What good these big trees do? There is no one to buy them. No, they'll find a market one of these days, I reckon. <laughs> and this city's going up south of here. We could just find a cheap way to send them our timber. They have many cities in this way. Well, you ought to see a town like Springfield, Illinois. And that's where my cousin Abe Lincoln lives. Not a lumberjack like me, but a real for sure lawyer. Gosh, when I look at him, I wish I could read a lot of books and make something of myself. Uh, you don't have to read a book to do that, Steve. You have a good brain. Uh, I don't know. All that's on my brain right now is how I could get word to Stillwater. Try and talk him out of starting the drive too soon. But the log drive has to start quick in spring, Steve. Hey! Yeah? What is it? Word from Stillwater. You're to start the drive at sunrise. At sunrise, huh? <laughs> well, that kind of settles my worries and leaves us to do the best we can. The great log drive started in the spring. Thousands of logs, a winter's harvest, rode the rivers toward the sawmills. Balancing deftly on top of them were the expert rivermen, using the utmost judgment and skill to avoid being thrown among the swift-running logs. Where rivers curved, the logs were apt to jam. A few days after the drive to the mill at Stillwater on the San Juan River had started, Steve Hanks and his helpers worked near open water to break up a jam. <laughs> yeah, be careful, Pierre. Those logs you're jumping over aren't steady. I am light as a feather. Nothing happened to me. Hey, Steve! Here's the key lock, jammed in a rock. Think I can get it with my cat hook? And now while we're out here in midstream, I'll call the boat. Let's hold! Oh! He is down! Come on. Be careful as we get near him, Dan. Don't fall in yourself. All right. Here's the open place. He's coming up again. I got you, Pierre. Hold me tight now. Hey, Dan, you straddle that log on the other side. All right. You can't get me out. Yeah, we can try here. All right. You ready? Steady on your log, Dan. I'm time on it. I got you, too. Yeah. All right, now. Pull together. All right. All right. There you go. Yeah. All right. I'll take him on this log. All right, now. Take it easy, Pierre. You're up now. That's it. I steady on it a minute now. You get your breath. I'll hold you. We better get him ashore, Steve. Suppose this jam broke on its own account. Yeah, Pierre, put your arm around my neck now. There. You stand? Easy. Are you almost walk by myself? Yes, you can. Here you are. I'll help him. Steve, now careful. All right. You're two good men. I think in that water I am gone. I don't see you, no. My baby's no more. Oh, forget it. Uh, watch that rock now. Yeah. Ain't easy now. Just a step further. Yeah. There you are. Yeah, we're safe. Oh. Lie down, Pierre. Hey, Steve, should I go tell the bateau to paddle out and use their cant hooks on that log? No, I'll shout. Bateau! We're going out, Steve! They'll break up that pile in a few minutes. Yeah. How do you feel, Pierre? I am better. I lie here. Hey! Steve Hank! Well, Wilkes, hey, what are you doing up here? Mr. Steele sent me up the river from Stillwater. If you have a big jam, don't break it. Stop the drive. Well, what's the matter? I'll call the bateau. Bateau! And the jam's broken. 
look at those logs race now. Well, why should we have tried to stop the drive, Wilkes? What's happened? Why, the water's so high, the boom is... Still water's broke. The boom's broke. The logs will be racing right past the mill. There's the whole winter's work for nothing. <laughs> at Stillwater, was a chain of logs stretched across the river to hold the timber back until the sawmill was ready for it. When it broke, the logs raced on. A few days later, at Stillwater, into the office of the mill, where despairing lumbermen are gathered, Steve Hanks enters. Hello, Mr. Steele. Hello. Uh, hello, 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 Steve. Take a chair. Sit in on the meeting. Mr. Hanks. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Hendricks. Well, what I want to know is, what's this town going to do? How can we last through next winter when every cent we've counted on has gone down this infernal river? Hanks, I'm trying to tell Mr. Steele that a lot of these logs he's soon by will pile up on shore further down. Get caught in eddies or drift into bays. Yes, McCusick, but how are you going to get the logs upstream again? Why get them upstream? Take them to sawmills downstream. There aren't any mills close. Float them all the way to market. Float them to St. Louis. St. Louis. It could be done, Mr. Steele. Make a raft of the logs we can salvage, just as we've made big rafts of dressed lumber. Why, I've floated timber rafts for two seasons now. Logs are different, heavy and tricky. Yes, but these men know logs, too. Music, you try your scheme. It's crazy. We'll see. Scout along the San Croix for what timber you can recover. Try to find a practical way to float it. I don't expect any miracles. Steve, will you handle the logs down the Mississippi? I'll be glad to, Mr. Steele. You can find the crew. You know the men. I'll get a crew. I don't know just how many logs we'll get through, but there'll be some arriving in St. Louis. Three huge rafts were formed, and under Steve Hanks, they started south on the river. The rafts were pulled ahead by tow lines fastened to anchors, which were laid ahead by rowboats and warped in by hand. The San Croix was safe, but dangerous Lake Pepin, with its difficult currents and sudden storms, was what the men feared most. A few days after the start, as the raft near the south end of Lake Pippin and safety. Steve, I don't like the middle of this lake with lightning on. There's no way we can beach a log raft as long as this one, Pierre. Yeah. No worry, Pierre. This lake gets to rearing around. We'll break up and go floating ashore on spinners. Hey, hey. Is that the skip signal on us? Yeah. Wind in the line. It's getting awful hard for us. They're going to be higher, so pull. Steve. Steve, we're in an awful bad place for a storm. If we could only speed it up a bit, we... what's that? Yeah, nothing to scare you. Just a little lake steamboat. Hey, Pierre. Yeah. Ring that cowbell you got so they won't run into us. All Get right. some darker and mischief here. Uh, uh, she's seen us. Say, if we could just scoot to the end of a lake like that boat does. Hey, that sure would fix us. Ahoy there, steamer! Hey! Hey, Pierre. Yes? Take your coat and wave it to him. Yes, I will. Come close! Yeah, he heard me all right. How do you want? Throw us a line! We want a tow! We want two. Can't you see? We ain't got no power of our own on these contraptions. We don't want to lose them in the storm. Can't your little boat pull us? Uh, this ship can pull anything that floats. Ten dollars! That's a lot of money, Steve. Well, Franklin Steele will be good for it. And we'll get the raft through Lake Pippin. Hey! That's this floor! Right! Got it! We'll wrap it on the windlass, then. All right. And it's away. All right! Go ahead! Look. Look, they're pulling all four of us easy. Yeah, just in time, too. Once in the river again, the flotilla was caught by the current and floated out onto the majestic sweep of the Mississippi. But Steve Hanks knew all the tricks of the great river, for he had floated rafts of dressed timber down it. About two weeks later, on board lead raft, Steve. Steve, wake up. Uh, what's the matter? Hey, where are we? How long have I been sleeping? You get some sleep first time in three days, so I don't like to wake you. But hey, what's that? I see that big town. St. Louis. 
All hands stand by. We're sweeping pretty close to shore, Steve. Well, let her ride. That first dock is the mill we're to go to. Now look, the folks starting to come down to the shore. Wondering what in heaven's name we're up to, bringing a whole forest on its side down to Mississippi. <laughs> stand by, men, to cast anchor. We win, Steve. We're on Mozilla. Yeah. Well, we'll all have something to brag about from now on. But Steve, mostly. Any worries always. He have no chance to do something in the world. Huh. Now everybody think he do plenty. It takes men of endurance and hardiness to accomplish a feat like that of Stephen Hanks and his helpers, salvaging thousands of logs and bringing them hundreds of miles to a southern market. They had shown the way for many others to follow. The cavalcade of America presented by DuPont moves on. Lumber was one of the first basic needs of America. But as the years passed, Other vast riches were discovered, especially petroleum deposits. It is 1898, a few miles from the town of Beaumont, Texas. Captain Anthony Lucas of Washington is talking with George Hamill, a Texan. What are you thinking about, Captain Lucas? Oh, I I don't know as I'm thinking at all, Hamill. Your Texas son makes me lazy. I reckon I know how you feel. Sitting out here in this lonely place all day... Hearing nothing to crank of this driller kind of puts me to sleep, too. <laughs> How'd you happen to come to Texas, Captain? Why, a young school teacher in Beaumont, Patillo Higgins, got me interested. Uh, sure, he's been talking about oil since he was knee high to a hot toad. Got oil on the brain. Yes, I suppose a lot of the natives around here don't put much faith in him. Yeah, some of them do. When we heard he was getting a real engineer and geologist down from Washington, we thought you'd just take a quick look around and leave. <laughs> That's what gets me, Captain. A man like you setting out on this lonely spot day after day. Well, that's my business, Hamill. Take patience to prospect for any sort of mineral. And the man who strikes oil west of the Mississippi, well... Yes, sir. I'm so used to thinking we won't strike oil. Last night, I got to wondering what would happen if we did. Folks would flock in here like they did to Pennsylvania, I reckon. Yeah? What's that? The engine stopped. Maybe they found something. Well, here comes your brother Sam in an awful hurry. Run! What's the matter? Run, I say, run for your life. Come on, come on. We're coming, but what for? Yes, what's the matter back there? Keep on the oil, I think. Water shooting out. Wind the other way. You didn't fail. There's Hump. Look out! barrels an hour, then 500, then 1,000. The oil spread widely in a sinister black lake. People rushed from all over the country to view the phenomenon. On the eighth day, Captain Lucas and his helpers frantically shoveled dirt from one of the embankments planned to hold the oil. Uh, Captain, we're not getting this embankment high enough. No. It's going to be overflowed like the others was. Well, there's nothing we can do but shovel, Hamill. We'll have to keep it up long, thank heavens. The engineers from the Star... Oil company are on the ground now. Uh, Star Oil Company? They sent men down here? Uh-huh. Why couldn't they, Sam? Everybody says it's the biggest well in the world. Yes, yes, a regular oil company will know how to control it. I hope they buy it this morning. Hey, Captain! Oh, here's Jim, all excited. What is it, Jim? Hey, Captain, there's, there's more letters for you at the shacks. Oh? Huh? How bushel basket for? Taking the postmaster into Beaumont's mighty sorry the day this gusher come in. You, uh, open the letters, Jim? Yeah, I did, some of them. All alike. Folks from New Orleans to Maine offering us a way to close the well. Yeah, some of them were right cute about it, too. Wouldn't tell us their idea until we paid them plenty. Well, I've had some sensible schemes set in at that. But I'd rather an experienced oil company get in here and handle it. I'm alarmed about what would happen if the oil catches fire. We might as well get burned up as drowned in oil. Oh, here's those engineers. Oh, Captain uh, Lucas? Uh, well, well, Mr. Regan. Have you, um... Have you finished your inspection? Yeah, Mr. Ross and I have gone over the ground thoroughly, Captain Lucas. Good. We've... Looked at the well from as close as we could get. I uh, estimate it's low at a thousand barrels right now. I knew you'd be astonished, gentlemen. I'm ready to talk business anytime you like. Uh, my crew can finish this, Mr. Uh, I, 
I'm sorry, Captain Lucas, but uh, your well's too big for any of the established oil companies, and... Uh, too big? There's more oil in that well than the whole world could use from now till the end of time. Yes. yes. The chief market for refined petroleum is kerosene for lamps. Lamps are gradually being replaced by electricity, so... Oh, much but I... oil, Captain Lucas, is more than the world needs. It's a surplus, useless product. Oh, no, no, I don't agree with you, sir. I'm only a mining engineer, not a chemist or a physicist, but where the Earth has provided a product like petroleum, men will find a use for it. Well, possibly, Captain, possibly, but uh, that's outside our province. Well, it's, it's been an amazing sight anyway, Captain. Thank you for giving us the opportunity of seeing. Yes, sir. Uh, we have to catch a train north tonight, so... Uh, we have to be on our way. Well, but, uh, goodbye, sir. Goodbye, Captain. Goodbye. Well, uh, that's too darn bad, Captain. Well, say, you you look right sorry about it. Well, Jim, I, I don't know what to do. I... The thing for us to do, Captain, is to show them they're wrong. Maybe we can get this well under control ourselves. You got any way worked out how to do it, Hamill? Uh, I've been so busy building them bank, I couldn't think much about it. Seems to me if we rigged up a kind of a carriage that'd anchor a gate valve against upward movement, we could divert the oil through a pipe. Yeah, but remember, you've got to launch that apparatus against a column of solid oil. Well, at least we can try it. Hamill, you quit shoveling and take enough men to build whatever you want. But hurry. <laughs> Hamill and his helpers worked valiantly, and Hamill's gate valve plan finally stemmed the flow of oil. But by this time, the dangerous Black Lake, 300,000 barrels of oil, had oozed relentlessly across the Texas prairie. In spite of the danger, thousands of prospectors arrived from everywhere, were drilling for oil. Early in March of that year, as the men at work were building embankments, Well, Captain, we ought to start operating our well pretty soon. Folks all around us here will strike oil and get into the market ahead of us. I know, I know, Hamill, but we've got to figure out what to do with this surface oil first. Well, you just let your own affairs go while you worry about what might happen. Uh, 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 what's up? Fire! 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 Come on, Captain, we better run. This oil play won't stay long where it is. Yes, this is the end of everyone around here that puts on the parry. They can't help it. Come on. Wait, wait. We'll build a backfire. You can't discourage a volcano, Captain. It's coming fast. Yeah, and if you fire this end of a pond, Captain, you'll be sure to lose all of the oil. What are you doing? Building the fire on this oil. Like your handkerchief, Hamill. You're going to lose every drop of what we work for, Captain. All right, man. Do you want all of Texas to go up and smoke? Stand back. This oil is going. The wind. What will happen when those two flames meet? Well, let's pray they explode. They're going to meet. I'll do it. Two towering walls of flame met. The explosion threw blazing oil high into the air and rocked the earth for miles around. And where the rich oil lake had been lay only blackened, charred masses of waste. When this waste had cooled, men ventured into the field to hunt for their well. A few days later, at the edge of the field, Hamill returns to report to Captain Lucas. Well, the bad news, Hamill. I can face anything now. Well, perfectly safe, Captain. What? That doesn't seem possible, Hammond. Well, I don't know about other folks' wells, because they may have been kind of careless about their rigging. But our pipes and gate valve are in place. Go and look for yourself. Oh, I, I hope you're right, Hammond. Yeah, Captain, you shouldn't just pace up and down here day and night. Fire's over. A lot of damage, but it wasn't your fault. You've got an oil well to run. It's been standing around long enough. Yes, yes, but look at those ruined black fields. Yeah, people swarming on them, thinking their hands. Geologist, prospect. Yes, curiosity seekers and wildcatters. How do you do? How do you do, gentlemen? I uh, don't want to intrude, but I spot you for oil, men. Oh, you do. I'm uh, offering you the last desirable lot left in this district. Ten thousand dollars an acre cash. Wait a minute. How much? The uh, lots are going from ten to one hundred thousand an acre. Now, if this lot was anywhere near Spindle Top, I'd have to charge you a hundred thousand. But, gentlemen, this whole region is soaked in oil. How do you know? <laughs> well, sir. The only reason any of us know is because a man named Lucas, a few people like him, had spunk enough to keep nosing around here till they found oil. The rest of us can now enjoy the benefits without working so hard. Listen, man, you're talking to Captain Lucas, who drills spindle top. Uh, Captain Lucas? Well, pardon me. Yeah. A great thing you've done for us, sir. Uh, pardon me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hamill, is, 
Is this land still bringing prices that high? Uh, you worried about burning up Texas, Captain. Well, that little fire that licked up 300,000 barrels of oil is just advertising. From now on, this state really starts to work. The western oil fields fulfill the expectations of patient, enduring men like Anthony Lucas. The expansion of American industry, especially the rise of the automobile business, put to work this great mineral wealth. Men of strength and hardiness developed America's natural resources. They deserve a special place of honor in the cavalcade of America. Everyone who uses an automobile or tractor or an oil furnace is a consumer of petroleum. Therefore, the intelligent national use of oil is an important matter to practically everyone. We all should do everything possible to conserve this tremendously useful natural resource. The research chemist has helped conserve our supplies of petroleum by developing more efficient ways of using it. The chief use of petroleum is for motor fuel. And the processes used in refining crude oil today yield nearly twice as much motor fuel as those of a few years ago. Chemists of the oil industry found a way to crack the heavy molecules of petroleum in a manner that increased the production of gasoline by billions of gallons every year without any greater drain on our oil reserves. Other chemical achievements have contributed toward making gasoline and lubricating oil more efficient and more economical. DuPont, for instance, has developed in collaboration with the oil industry some remarkably effective chemicals called antioxidants. These chemicals curb the natural tendency of cracked gasolines to oxidize and form gummy compounds. They are so efficient that one pound is enough to stabilize 50,000 pounds of gasoline. You as a motor car owner gain a direct benefit from these antioxidants. For they check the formation of gum, which otherwise would foul the working parts of your engine, wasting its power and preventing its efficient operation. DuPont chemists working with the petroleum industry have also developed a number of products called extreme pressure lubricant bases. Oils and greases containing these products last longer and give better protection. Extreme pressure lubricant bases create tougher oil films, which stick to metal surfaces better thus saving wear and tear on cylinders, gears, and other working parts. Chemical products such as these serve you so inconspicuously that you are hardly aware of their existence, but they stand as one more illustration of the DuPont pledge, better things for a better living through chemistry. <laughs> will be the title of the program next week at this same time when DuPont again presents The Cavalcade of America. <laughs> this is the Columbia Broadcasting System. W-A-B-C, New York.